My name is Agathe. I'm one of the uh, management team a member of the Next UK project. Um, for the ones who maybe do not know this uh, project, this is uh, co-funded by the Erasmus Plus program of the European Union. And it's aimed at uh, studying mostly the EU-UK relationship in light of Brexit. So I'm um, very pleased today to, to chair this, this event. It's the first Next UK uh, Coffee and Politics. So we are very happy and we would like, uh, first of all, to, to thank Joanne for having accepted our idea for having helped us with uh, the organization of the, of the events. Uh, thank you also, of course, to our guest uh, for today, so Robert Sanders, who is here and from uh, Queen Mary University in London, and Calypso Nicolaidis from Oxford University. So we're very glad to welcome these two experts to have their insights on the current state of democracy in a post-Brexit, but also uh, in a post-COVID uh, Britain. So, um, we had a lot of ideas. We we were thinking with Sarah uh, about the rise of populist uh, speeches and ideas, a growing dissatisfaction um, towards political elites, whether uh, the national or the European ones, uh, the strong internal divides of conservative and the Labour, the attempts of Boris Johnson to exclude uh, MPs from the Brexit decision making, the ongoing reflection on constitutional reforms. So, these are only some examples of um, topics which raise a lot of questions about what is going on with uh, democracy in Britain and even maybe in the EU today. So to, to offer some thoughts on um, some of these questions, because I think it will be quite hard to, to cover them all. Uh, we have two leading scholars uh, who kindly accepted our invitation for today. So the first one is Robert. Robert is a modern, uh, is a reader in modern British history, and he, um, with a strong focus in his research on the history of democracy and democratic thoughts in Britain. This is a topic he has intensively explored in his publication, and I'm very sure his long-term vision about democracy in Britain will be very helpful to better understand the ongoing issues of democracy, um, how to interpret these events, and other events I haven't mentioned, uh, maybe other conti either continuity of uh, pre-existing transformation or if there's something completely new appearing today. And then we will listen to Calypso. Calypso is a professor of international relations at the University of Oxford and she's also a governing body fellow at St. Anthony's College. Um, it quite hard to say in a few words what uh, Calypso research is because her research covers many different areas, but she has, among other things, uh, questioned democracy in Europe. And in a recent book, Exodus, Reckoning, Sacrifice, Three Meanings of Brexit, a book uh, which was published in 2019, she um, particularly engaged in this topic through the analysis of Brexit and its potential different interpretations. So, we will um, first listen to both of them. We will start with Robert uh, during 10 minutes. Then Calypso, we also have the floor for 10 minutes. Um, then the floor will go back to you, Robert, to react to Calypso's thoughts for like five minutes and vice versa. Um, then we'll take questions from the audience. So the first part, while we're listening to Robert and to Calypso, this first part will be uh, recorded. Uh, but then uh, for, for people who, not, uh, who are not being able to attend this event, to still be able to watch it and to listen to uh, Robert and to Calypso. But then the recording will stop at uh, for the second part, uh, the Q and A part. So um, do not uh, feel shy uh, for the audience to switch on uh, your microphone if you want to ask a question. Um, you can also um, write your question in the chat, and then I will ask the, uh, them to uh, Robert and Calypso. So. I think um, it's time now to, to listen to, to you, Robert. So I will leave you uh, the floor and I'm very curious to hear your thoughts on uh, British democracy today. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation and thanks to you all for coming. It sounds like we're going to have quite a lot to get through. So I was thinking about what I might say today and um, to help with that, I started pulling some of the books off my shelves about democracy. 
And it struck me that they all had a rather gloomy theme. So we have how democracy ends, how democracies die, democracy hacked, democracy for sale, and all sorts of other titles with a very similar kind of message. And they paint a very compelling picture of a democracy under siege from autocratic strongmen, from digital disinformation, from dark money, and from extreme political polarization. I think they're very compelling books. And if we wanted an illustration of the power of those forces, I think we saw them at work in the Capitol at the start of January. But I want to slightly push back against this because I also think that there's a paradox here, which is that democracy seems to be both under constant assault and the hegemonic idea of Western politics. Democracy is the nearest thing that we have to a civic religion in the modern world. It is the one thing in which almost everybody in British and European and American politics claims to believe. So we are nowhere near the kind of situation that we saw in France in the 19th century, where political parties organized around different visions of the constitution, where you had monarchists, republicans, bonapartists, communards, and so on. Everybody in British politics calls themselves a Democrat. And the kinds of parties or political movements that people like me might be alarmed at are all thriving in democratic systems. So how do we explain that? Well, I said just now that democracy is the civic religion of British politics. And I think that religious analogy is potentially quite helpful. Historically, you can have a society in which everybody is Christian or everybody is Muslim, but which is racked by religious conflict between Catholics and Protestants, between Sunni and Shia, uh, between Anglicans and nonconformists, and so on. And those conflicts can fracture the very core of a, of a society. So arguments between Christians about Christianity redrew the entire map of Europe in the early modern period. And they didn't see these battles as some kind of family falling out. They saw them as a war between Christianity and its enemies. Now, it seems to me that something similar is happening in the democratic world today. Democracy expresses a belief, perhaps even a sacred principle, the idea that the people should govern, that the people are the only legitimate source of authority. But it doesn't tell us who the people are or how they should govern. So Democrats tend to splinter historically into a variety of different democratic sects. They might worship at the shrine of liberal democracy or parliamentary democracy or direct democracy or industrial democracy or the democracy of the market. If we could perform some kind of occult ritual and bring Margaret Thatcher back to life, and these online seminars often have a touch of the seance about them, um, Margaret Thatcher would tell us that democracy can only exist in a capitalist society, that democracy and capitalism are inseparable, and therefore that socialism is intrinsically hostile to, to democracy. That would bring someone like the Labour MP Zara Sultana onto the call, who would tell us that capitalism and democracy are fundamentally opposed, that we cannot have true democracy until we have overthrown capitalism. Now, both Margaret Thatcher and Zara, Zara Sultana are Democrats but they would each regard the other as an enemy of democracy. And I think we saw some of that in the Brexit wars of the last four or five years. The Brexit wars were so toxic because both sides genuinely believed that they were fighting for democracy and that they were fighting against the enemies of democracy. And that is not the kind of struggle that has much room for compromise. So many Brexiteers, passionately believed that Remainers were trying to overthrow a democratic referendum, that Remainer judges and a Remainer parliament were subverting the will of the people. Conversely, Remainers like me looked on in horror at a Leave government that was 
shutting down Parliament, trying to override parliamentary scrutiny, browbeating the courts, and treating opposition as unpatriotic. And it was, I was struck that on the day that the Capitol was attacked, half of my Twitter feed was full of people saying, this is like Boris Johnson shutting down Parliament. The other half of my Twitter feed was people saying, this is what Remainers tried to do when they tried to overthrow an election result. So everyone in British politics thinks that someone else is trying to subvert democracy. And I think something similar is happening um, in relation to Scottish independence and all sorts of other questions of British politics. Now, I don't think that Brexit was an attack on democracy. In fact, in its own way, much as I deplored the result, it was a remarkable democratic moment. It showed that one vote of the British public could essentially sweep aside the settled policy of every British government for the last 50 years. But what it has done is to accelerate a shift from one version of democracy to another. And to go back to the religious analogy, religious wars are particularly likely when a new idea is on the march. In the 16th century, that was Protestantism. In the 21st century, it's populism. Now, populism, of course, can mean many different things. And there are lots of people here who know more about it than I do. But I want to use it here in a fairly specific sense to refer to an authoritarian version of democracy that rejects many of the assumptions of liberal democracy. Liberal democracies are essentially pluralist. So they start from the assumption that the people are a great mass of different ideas and interests and opinions, and all of them form part of the democratic will. So they tend to try to provide safeguards for minority interests, protections for dissent, and some kind of institutionalization of opposition. And they do all of those things, not as constraints upon democracy, but as the expression of a particular version of democracy. Now, in Britain, those things have historically been done chiefly through Parliament. So at a general election, we returned 650 MPs from the length and breadth of the country, who range politically from Diane Abbott on the left to Priti Patel on the right. And all of those MPs have a democratic mandate from their constituents. The leader of the opposition is a publicly salaried post. And in fact, the archaic title of that role expresses something really important. Technically, Keir Starmer is the leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition, which expresses the idea that opposition is something that happens inside a democracy that is a contribution to democracy, not something that stands outside of it and is an attack upon it. Laws are interpreted by the courts and can only be changed by Parliament. And crucially, it is in Parliament as a whole, not in the executive, that sovereignty is supposed to reside. Now, populism rejects many of those assumptions. It sees the will of the people in much more crudely majoritarian terms. So if the will of the people is for Brexit or for Trump or whatever it may be, then those who oppose that view are enemies of the people. It also tends to view constraints upon its power as anti-democratic, whether they come from the courts or from ethical constraints or from minority parties in Parliament. And its view tends to be, we won the election, so why should courts challenge ministerial decisions? Why should we have to debate this endlessly in Parliament? Why should the ministerial code or the Nolan principles stop us appointing who we want to? in public life? Why should we be bound by international treaties, whether that's the withdrawal agreement or the Paris Climate Accords? Now, Britain is nowhere near as far down that road as some other countries, but it is, I think, the direction of travel. We have seen judges pasted across tabloid front pages as enemies of the people. We've seen government trying to write into law its right to break international agreements. When the Liberal Democrats voted against the Brexit trade deal, an attack ad immediately went up online, calling them Democrats in name only. Now, personally, I would not have voted against the trade deal, but I think it's hard to argue 
that the Liberal Democrats were not expressing the views of some section of our democracy when they did that, but it was marked out as illegitimate. When it looked like Parliament might block a no-deal Brexit, an attempt was made to close Parliament down. When the courts granted Parliament or confirmed the right of Parliament to trigger Article 50, that was treated in sections of the press as a coup d'etat. There has been a huge expansion of government by ministerial decree through secondary legislation and Henry VIII clauses. And that's been something accelerated by COVID as well as by Brexit. And it's striking that on the two biggest questions of British public life of the last few years, Brexit and COVID, Parliament has been consistently pushed to one side. So the institutions of a liberal democracy, Parliament, the courts, independent media, the importance of opposition, those things I think are indeed in retreat, but they are being attacked in the name of democracy. They are being held up as constraints upon the will of the people. And it's that claim which is giving these attacks their power. So it's no good, I think, saying we believe in democracy and our opponent don't, because that is always going to be vulnerable to the reply, well, we won the election or we won the referendum. Instead, I think we have to decide what kind of democracy we want. And people of my political wing have to relearn the case for liberal democracy and the institutions of a liberal democracy and the ability to make that case in public. Because unless we do that, liberal democracy will continue to retreat and authoritarian populist forms of democracy will continue to advance. I think that's my 10 minutes, so I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much for this um, passionating uh, thoughts, I have to say. Uh, I, I really like the, the idea of, at the end, everyone's Everyone wants a democracy, but it's just different forms of democracy. So I think uh, it's something we will have um, very interesting debates with uh, with our audience a bit later. So now uh, I will welcome Calypso. Thank you very much, Calypso, for, for being here uh, today. Uh, I will leave you the floor for 10 minutes to you've got freedom of speech so for whatever uh, you want us to you want to tell us. And then I will give the floor back to Robert to react to your thoughts and then vice versa, you, you will have the floor again. Is it okay for you? Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Agathe, and thank you, Queen Mary, and wonderful to see you. I'm, I'm in Florence, one of the uh, places where democracy was born. We compete with Westminster <laughs> in claiming to have invented it. But, you know, being also Greek, I even have another place that um, claims to have invented democracy. So there you are. It's the most beloved um, orphan in the world that has so many parents, adoptive parents, democracy. And so it's fair enough that uh, we're asking, after having lived through the turmoil of Brexit, you know, who has won in this democratic claim? And I mean, I think Robert has made a really brilliant case for the multifaceted aspect of this um, question. Uh, and above all, can we all agree? We don't know yet, right? Brexit is a great test that is only beginning. And you were asking me, Agathe and Sarah, you know, um, what is Europe making out of this? So we, are, we have to start with what we see in Britain. I've only left Britain a couple of weeks ago. And of course, we all observe everything from, from afar. But And then ask, well, how, how do Europeans react? And, and the great question becomes, you know, if, if indeed um, democracy is about authorship, by citizens of their individual and collective destiny, uh, then, you know, Brexit on the face of it looks good on that count. But if you add to that sentence, authorship in an interdependent world full of externalities, then that's how you qualify the original and pure version of democracy. And so there is no question that the the democratic question of Brexit and the democratic rationale of Brexit and the democratic malaise that Brexit came from is itself indeed a reflection of similar challenges all over Europe and indeed around the world. So let me just say that my big, big point um, is that we need to think about this dem democratic demonstration effect, right? Can we call, them that, call it that, of Brexit? 
And, you know, if you believe the, let's call them the progressive Brexiters, like my former student and colleague Chris Bickerton and Tuck and others, who defend Brexit not from a patriotic kind of uh, taking back control purely, of course taking back control, but simply from the very basic fact that the EU transforms uh, state back into a nation state, that it will take time, but that the characteristic of a member state is yes, it cooperates nicely, but that is a mechanism by which elites are able to um, conspire with each other to do things in the back of their respective peoples. And in fact, it was fascinating to observe that after Brexit, there were polls that were showing that European kind of elite class were feeling closer to each other than to their own kind of national population, which is good or bad, depending on what you, where you are. But the bet is that, the bet is that Brussels for all, all its qualities, even if you're pro-European, um, is a Weberian iron cage, bureaucratic iron cage. I like to say it's an iron cage in a bubble. I like to mix my metaphor. And if you add to this, the capitalist or neoliberal lock-in that Robert was just talking about, you have an iron cage in a bubble there to kind of serve a capitalist system that you can't change. So there is, is the Tina no alternative. The case looks pretty good for Brexit. But then on the other side, the demonstration effect will be, okay, fine, you get out of this iron cage. But how do you manage your interdependence democratically? When by definition, if you trade, if you have relations with the rest of the world, the world has a say on your rules and regulation. And the other bit of that ledger is something I think even more profound, which is that Brexit is something I, I wrote in my book, Exodus, Reckoning, Sacrifice, Three Meanings of Brexit. In terms of sacrifice, you could think of Brexit as a sacrificial moment, whereby with all its costs for the British people, Brexit is there to demonstrate that the EU is not a cage, that you can leave it. It's not Hotel California. It's, possible. it's hard to leave, but you can leave it. So it defeats all the arguments about the super state and all the rest of it, since you can leave it. Now, in my book, I argue, like, like Robert, you know, as a remainder, it, it, you can leave it and therefore you shouldn't. That's the demonstration effect. But the question is whether these two very strong arguments, how do they balance each other? And, and very quickly, I got three points that are all relevant to democracy. One is repatriation, the other is representation, and the third is participation, you know, pillars of democracy. Now, on, on repatriation, because that's what Brexit is all about, is to repatriate all sorts of competences that are then controlled democratically. And of course, I, let's have a conversation about the vaccine world. That's kind of, you know, Spike wrote, Spike, you know, Brexiter, Democratic Brexiter, um, wrote a few days ago that, you know, the democratic right of nation, the vaccine world demonstrates that the de de democratic right of nations to make their own decisions and what they consider to be the best interest of their people and the vaccine desire disaster should re-inject momentum into the arguments for Brexit, Brexit, et cetera. And indeed, it is an interesting moment where we see that both upstream, the UK was able to be more nimble and downstream, decisions were taken very undemocratically in the EU. So the, here's an argument for repatriation. But, and, and of course we could make it more generally, but there is of course lots of us, when we, when we put the democratic test to how competences are being to add on this moment repatriated, right, uh, in the UK. Horizontally, everything Robert has said already about, is it the parliament or is the executive? Parliament pushed to one side, conversation. Secondly, vertically, the devolved, it's the devolved nations, both in terms of centralization, who is really deciding uh, and who gets these competences and who uses them. And the whole horizontal devolution involved with recreating an internal market in the UK, something fascinating whereby the UK is copying the EU rules uh, of the internal market um, in mutually recognizing the, the rules that pertain in in Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland. And, and of course, um, so this is the repatriation to be watched. What you gain, what do you lose? Um, and it's interesting indeed to see in Europe that Brexit has been followed by indeed 
calls for repatriation, the remoteness argument and all of that, but not all the way to leaving the EU. Can we stop beforehand? Um, in my view, there's a normative argument there about circles for autonomy that is very important. The second point I was going to make as in, in the big demonstration test is that of representation. I mean, absolutely, there is no hiding that the UK elite can no longer hide behind their pulse, other PMs and governments or bureaucracies uh, when decisions go wrong, uh, that they are accountable, that you can throw the, the rascals out. And all of this is going to be watched as a plus in, in the world, I believe. So where is the bot? Well, the bot is, of course, that this entrenches majorities. Robert was very absolutely talking about democracy or liberal democracy, about uh, rights of minority. Well, you can consider the Scots as minorities. Of course, Brexit means that you know majorities are more entrenched in the UK, as well as entrenching polarization. Um, and and all of this, while um, at the same time, you, on the other side of the ledger, the UK is losing representation at the center, of course, in Brussels. But the, the democratic plus of that representation is diluted, right? It's more abstract. Yeah, actually, you do pay taxes to, through Brussels. Brussels decides how you grow, etc. But it's less visible. So again, there is a balance there on representation. And the, my final point, because I know I only have one minute left, I got so I'm watching the watch, the watch, is on participation. And that actually is the next frontier of our dem democratic conversation in the world. How do we rethink alongside democratic representation, you know, participation, deliberation, radical participation, agonistic democracy, and there, uh, let me make an, a kind of slightly paradoxical argument, which is because the EU is not that democratic, it has something to prove. And it's certainly not democratic in the rep traditional representative way, which is why there's so much talk right now, and I'm very involved in this, in the Conference on the Future of Europe, about exploring new mechanisms of transnational democracy. How do you involve citizens through citizens' assemblies, connected across borders through panels and surveys and um, and all sorts of mechanisms through the internet, virtual democracy um, and, and many other things that we're having lots of, you know, brainstorm exploring and somehow the EU, because it has to prove itself right, because it's it can be majoritarian for the reasons we can discuss, because it's a space to organize democratic externalities democratically or democratically, as I would say, it needs to push that frontier. Now, I'm not saying it has pushed it or will push it, but the agenda is more pressing than in a national context where you can rest kind of secure in your complacency with democratic representation all the while, while that's hollowed out. And so there is a paradox there because, of course, in Britain, we have experimented with citizens' assembly and at the local level, a lot of direct democracy, all of that. But that hasn't percolated up to national democratic mechanism or not enough, although it has to some extent. So here we have the ultimate com contest between democratic autonomy, bottom-up democracy autonomy, or democratic interdependence, bottom-up participation and effervescence. And this is going to be the great competition. So let me make this suggestion to all of you. Let's be open-minded. Let's consider Brexit as a democratic test. Um, add on it some spice of COVID, which also makes us rethink democracy in very different ways. And you have a, a fascinating test, but the jury is out and let's, let's not decide in advance uh, what will happen with this test and which side will our vote go. Thank you. Thank you very much, Calypso, for, for all the thoughts uh, uh, about how Brexit is a test. I think it's it's really interesting and it um, goes well with uh, what Robert was uh, saying to the so really two complementary um, views. And maybe, uh, Robert, you want to, to react to Calypso's uh, speech? Yes, so thanks, Calypso. That was absolutely fascinating. And there's all sorts of things that I'd like to um, bring up, but so that we can get to the the rest of the of the room, I'll just mention two or three. Um, so, firstly, your point about that this is in a sense a test of democracy, and 
and connecting that to the point I was making about the idea of a challenge to democracy, because I, I think it is really important to say that if there is a democratic crisis in Britain at the moment, it certainly didn't begin in 2016. And that in a sense, the Brexit referendum was as much an expression of the problems and failures of British democracy as it was any kind of cause that it's too simple to say that Brexit was a vote of the left behind. We know that economically and all sorts of other ways that wasn't wholly true. But it clearly was the case that very large numbers of people came out to vote who hadn't voted at a general election for years or even decades, who felt for the first time in a long time that their voice was being heard here and who felt that this was a chance to reassert democracy against a distant decision making process in Brussels and against an arrogant decision making elite in Westminster. And I think there, need, there, there should have been more soul searching than there has been among people on my side of the political fence about how we reach that point. Um, you know, how it was that in 2015, UKIP won four million votes and got one member of parliament who was essentially a Tory plant anyway, that essentially four million votes were put into our electoral system and flushed down the toilet. And that in, you know, in all sorts of ways, Brexit should have been seen as exposing the failures of Britain's previous democratic model, rather than simply becoming something that we shouted at. On the point about sovereignty, one of the things that I found really frustrating about the Remain campaign was its absolute refusal to engage with the question of sovereignty. It simply ceded it. There was an important case made by the Leave campaign that Britain had given up sovereignty and that sovereignty was the manifestation of democracy. And the response to the Remain campaign essentially was to say, yeah, but you'll be poorer. You know, the Remain campaign's central message was we hate the EU too, but we can't afford to leave. And actually, as we've been seeing since, there is a serious argument to be made about the way in which participation in international institutions strengthens your sovereignty because sovereignty is is not about asserting independence it's about managing interdependence and it's about gaining some kind of control over your relations with the rest of the world no attempt was made to put that case across at all and i think that was a major failure of the remain campaign and then finally um just the point about centralization i do think it's one of the big paradoxes of brexit that in many ways Brexit was a protest against centralisation. It was about the idea that we are repatriating power from Brussels, that we're taking back control to ourselves. And yet, its expression in Westminster has involved a massive ramping up of centralisation within the UK. The UK was already a very centralised state. It's become a much more centralised one um, as a result of the Brexit process that both Theresa May and Boris Johnson took ownership of the Brexit process very personally and were very reluctant to share that or to bring anyone else into that, um, that process. And I thought it was remarkable in the last days of December that a country of 68 million people was sitting around waiting to hear whether Boris Johnson would make a deal or not, and if so, what he would decide to sign up to. It really did appear that everything at that point rested in the hands of one person, and none of us had a clue what it was that he was going to do. So it has brought back control to Westminster, but it's not just brought it back from the EU, it's brought it back from the UK more broadly. And I think this is going to cause huge ruptures in the union. Um, it's clearly intended on some level to draw power back from the devolved assemblies and back from the devolved nations. Um, and that's going to create a very similar dynamic to the one that delivered Brexit in the arguments around Scottish independence, Irish reunification, and maybe further down the line, um, <clears throat> constitutional change in Wales. So those are just three points um, in immediate response. Yes, Caleb, so if, if you want to react to what Robert just uh, mentioned or to anything from uh, his speech, feel free. Well, in bullet points, because yes, we want to hear the Q&N, have a conversation, and also because Robert and I are very much on the same wavelength. I mean, can I accentuate a bit, a couple of your points 
kind of on the Brexit side, because you're so right that Brexit was a reflection of uh, a, a system that wasn't working in Britain. Um, and so it was a vote against London, perhaps even more than against Brussels. Absolutely. Um, but could we say that it, in that sense, um, it, 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 the, the part of the vote that was against Brussels, I mean, these two things are not separate. And Brussels does empower around Europe um, the flushing down the toilet, I liked your expression, Robert, of lots of votes, you know, like all the Greeks who voted no in the referendum. That's, you know, 68% of Greeks. Now, I happen to have campaigned for a yes in that referendum, but I'm not the one, I'm, I do, I'm not a Brechtian. You know how Brecht said, if you don't, if you don't agree with the people, just re-elect the people. Well, Brussels does that all the time. And, it, you know, when a vote is not right, it does this for Ireland and it couldn't do it with Brexit. Uh, but there is a real problem of Brussels flushing votes down the toilet. So it's not just a kind of British pathology here. And that's what we need to correct in, in, in the EU. You know, if we draw lessons from this whole Brexit saga as to the, you know, what should change in Brussels? This is one of them. Absolutely. Your second point, Robert. I have made it too, and when I teach IR, come on, you know, sovereignty needs to be shared because we the challenges are shared and, and we need to coordinate. And it is a true point, but we can't be complacent about that point either. You do give up sovereignty to, to the WTO or the World Health Organization or the IMF, or you do. And we can say, well, yeah, but you get it back collectively. Nevertheless, you know, these organizations and the strong states within them take decisions in your name. So the, uh, they don't always mitigate asymmetries of power in the world, in Europe and in the world. So if, if you're in the EU, you know, Germany's going to have a big say in your democracy. And that is a problem. And I'm so in agreement with you that, therefore, um, the the Remain camp should have taken on sovereignty heads on in a more subtle way. And granted that, yeah, there's a loss, there are gains, you know, let's think about it and what we gain from, but not just always simply reply, well, we don't really lose sovereignty. I mean, it's, it's, more, it's harder than that. And finally, the you're agreeing with me about the, the centralization and, and adding the political process. Brexit was all about what was happening in Westminster. I think what's going to be really, really interesting to watch is, you know, we've repatriated agricultural policy. Who is going to decide? Is it going to be, you know, so both, you know, in terms of stakeholders, the farmers, all these communities that didn't really have much of a say in Brussels, it was too far, um, local authorities, but also citizens, you know, for our food standards or whatever. Um, at which level, which stakeholders? I mean, I mean, in some ways, I, you know, I want to be optimistic. I want to believe in British democracy. And that's because, you know, I may be more royalist than the king because I only became British an, a year and a half ago, Robert. So unlike you, you know, I haven't quite gotten used to it. <laughs> and I'm still very proud of being British. And I really think Britain has so much, you know, um, resources, his, historical, uh, creative, young people, etc. So there is potential, but the first condition of possibility, as Hegel would say, would, is really to empower democratic innovators, to let these forces of democratic creativity happen. I mean, I don't think Brexit has to be a democratic disaster. Unfortunately, of course, the elites in power make a big difference. What spaces do they open and what spaces do they close for democratic innovation, right? So that would be the questions I would kind of throw back in, in, in return. A lot of open questions. So thank you. Uh, thank you to, to both of you. A lot of um, food for thought for sure.